thank you everyone for being here today and uh, welcome to the Latin America Summit panel on uh, promoting social and business innovation in Latin America. I am uh, Victoria Pañagua and I'm assistant professor in international political economy here at the, at the London School of Economics. And today I have uh, the great pleasure of being chairing this panel with our keynote speaker, Sebastián Seria, uh, who was very kind to um, share this panel uh, with me here today. And um, I would like to uh, start by briefly introducing Sebastian. Then uh, if you all agree, uh, I have prepared a set of questions to, to, to kick off a conversation with him. And then we'll open uh, a round of questions and answers from the audience, all right? So, well, Sebastian is an Argentinian mathematician. He is the CEO of the FinTech company Contigo. He is also the founder and president of Fundar, a public policy think tank that is uh, based in Argentina and that was founded in 2019. Uh, he was previously also the CEO of Axioma, a company he founded in 1998. And furthermore, Sebastian is also a former academic. Uh, before becoming a very successful uh, business entrepreneur, he was a professor at the Columbia Business School. So thank you, Sebastian, for being here today. And I would like to begin by asking you a little bit about your background. So uh, I thought it would be a good idea if you start by telling us uh, more about yourself and about your journey as an, a business person, a former academic, and a philanthropist as well. So, well, thank you so much for having me, and thanks all for coming. And we'll let's try to make it as you know, interactive as possible, uh, so that if you want to interrupt at any point in time, feel free to do so. Uh, so as Victoria said, I'm originally from Argentina. I studied applied math um, in Argentina, the faculty of uh, exact sciences in the University of Buenos Aires. And from there, I left with a fellowship to do my PhD at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Uh, Carnegie Mellon had a department which was very prestigious in an area that I wanted to study, which is a very esoteric area of optimization called integer programming. Um, if you want at any point in time, any, anybody who's interested, I can talk for hours about integer programming. I don't think that's the purpose here. But anyway, I finished my PhD and I did what I guess every PhD student is supposed to do, which is to ask his advisor. I had two advisors to ask the two advisors, what should I do next? And they said, of course, you have to do a career in academia. So I applied to a variety of places and ended up with a job at the Columbia Business School, where I taught integer programming, but mostly decision models, uh, which is sort of a quantitative way of making decisions through you know, mathematical models and spreadsheets and algorithms that at the time was a little bit of an obscure area. Today is obviously commonplace. Almost all of our lives is more or less driven by algorithms. That's more or less what I did um, during my dissertation and then during my PhD, uh, during my professorship at Columbia. Uh, I was also teaching MBAs and most of my, I enjoyed teaching MBAs. Most of my colleagues didn't, they hated teaching MBAs. I actually thought that teaching MBAs was very, very good because they asked you all the time, why? You know, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And I think why is the most interesting three letter question that somebody can ask. And I thought it was appropriate that I was teaching mathematical models and the MBAs would ask, well, why is this useful? Why is this important? Um, that was just to give you a sense of time. This is probably before many of you were born. This was 1996, 97, 98, which was the internet boom. A lot of my students were starting companies, um, mostly around the internet. So I said to myself, you know, this academia stuff is rather boring, sorry, Victoria. <laughs> And um, why don't I just go into industry and start a company myself? And that's what I did. And my idea was, you know, there's many ways of starting companies. There's many people that start companies because they have just business ideas. My idea was to really leverage my expertise, which was in the area of mathematical models. So what did my company do? We built mathematical models, mostly for helping different industries make better decisions. Some of you may have heard of this discipline called operations research. Operations research is not a very famous discipline, but it is the one that 
essentially tries to model business problems where you're making decisions um, with scarce resources. And then the idea is you build mathematical models, you write algorithms, and then you let the computer more or less tell you what to do. Anyway, what we did when we started was we were building all sorts of models for all kinds of different areas. Uh, it was the internet, so most of our stuff had to do with the internet. There were logistics projects, we were working on advertising, we're working on auctions, lots and lots of different stuff. And uh, just by happenstance, like a lot of these things happen, one of my former students ended up working at Goldman Sachs, and they asked us whether we could build a model for uh, building good portfolios, or risk managed portfolios, and optimization is exactly the right sort of discipline for doing that, there's a very famous model that was built by somebody called Harry Markowitz um, in the 50s, which is called mean variance optimization. So that's the basic model for making good portfolios. We ended up building a model for Goldman, and then um, the internet, the internet blew up, or the bubble burst, or however you want to call it, in the early 2000s. And then we decided to concentrate on financial services. So we became a little bit by chance a fintech. Uh, that firm was called Axioma. We grew Axioma from nothing until um, you know, 2019, where we had you know, 100 million in revenue, about 200 employees. Uh, we have clients all over the world, and then decided to sell Axioma to Deutsche Börse. And that was in 2019. My timing was actually quite good and then sold the company, and Deutsche Börse asked me to merge Axioma with a company that they had within Deutsche Börse called Stocks. Stocks, you may know because they're the famous creators of the stocks indices that are the Stock 600, which are the premier European indices. So we merged Stocks and Axioma, and I agreed to stay for a period of time, which was three years at the beginning, and now it's a little bit over three years uh, to merge the two companies, Axioma and Stocks. And now Axioma and Stocks are Contigo, which is a deformation of the Spanish word Contigo, which means to be with you. Uh, but since we didn't want to call it Contigo with a C, we called it Contigo with a Q, mostly because the website was not taken. So that was a good way <laughs> of guaranteeing our branding. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. Uh, so let me. So that has nothing to do with Argentina, nothing to do with Latin America, except for maybe a couple of small details that I will mention. And I'm going to go back in time and tell you the Argentina story, because I think that's quite relevant and actually um, probably more interesting than Contigo, to be honest. Um, so uh, one one of the things that was important for me uh, when I was uh, running Contigo was that I thought it would be possible to have an R&D lab in Argentina. And in 2017, 16, we opened a research and development center in Argentina. Uh, in particular, because a lot of the people we hire are mathematicians, physicists, statisticians, which there's plenty of in, in Argentina and, and very few of them in industry. And so it would be a nice way of capturing a lot of that talent and having that capability in Argentina. I also thought that it was good because it would create like a positive or, or self-replicating ecosystem that potentially over time, you know, one of the things you learn when you're running a company is that a lot of people that you hire leave. And when they leave, some of them go to work for others, competitors, but some of them decide to open their own company. So that could be a good way of sort of expanding and creating a nice ecosystem in Argentina. Um, second is, um, you know, I knew the quality of the talent that was there. I had a lot of connections with the universities, so I thought it would be uh, quite good. And we would be quite able to hire really good talent, which was becoming more and more difficult for us at Axioma in New York because we were competing with uh, financial institutions, with hedge funds. You know, a lot of the people that we hired uh, would get paid a lot more money if they went to work for banks or hedge funds or, or asset managers. So it would be also a good way of, of diversifying our talent pool that was very was becoming more and more difficult to get in New York. And when it comes to, I mean, we build software. So when it comes to computer scientists, it would also be a good place to hire a lot of talent. I mean, some of you may know, but there's a number of Argentinian companies 
that uh, and we can talk a little bit about what generated this positive development in Argentina, but there's a number of Argentinian companies that do um, the software development. My brother actually run, uh, he worked at one of them that was a pretty substantial one, not one of the largest, but then he ended up running a research and development center for a US company called Medallia, uh, which is a customer experience company in the US, actually one of the two leading companies. And I thought that there was a good opportunity of building like a strong foundation there. So that's my relationship between Axioma slash Contigo and Argentina. Um, but other than that, I never lost my connection to Argentina. I mean, obviously went through ups and downs like Argentina did, but always kept um, good relationship with the universities. I had a number of doctoral students at the university while I was at, at Columbia. And then, um, there was a little bit of a hiatus when I was starting the company because I was super busy. You know, being an entrepreneur is non-trivial. But in 2007, as things settled down a bit, um, I came up with a crazy project, which was to build uh, a new building at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, which would house the Department of Computer Science, a place called the Instituto de Calculo, which is another crazy story that I'll tell you if we have time, and the uh, Department of uh, Climate. And um, I had the idea, the university wanted, you know, all these places were housed in the University of Buenos Aires, which has very poor infrastructure. For those of you who've been to the Ciudad Universitaria, you could see how decrepit the infrastructure was. And when I was studying there, I always had the idea. My dream was always to build a new building and to uh, blow up the existing one. Um, I managed to do the former, but not the latter yet, although I'm, I'm still hopeful that one of these days I'll be able to blow up the, the other building. Um, but in any case, managed to convince uh, the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology um, and the CAF, the Corporación Andina de Fomento, to fund the construction of a new building, which is now called Cero Mas Infinito, which is a very... Um, state-of-the-art building that was, uh, the design was donated by a very famous architect that just passed away, a Uruguayan called Rafael Vignoli. So that was one big connection that I had starting in 2007. Um, in 2012, I became the director of the Raices program. The Raices program is a program that uh, Argentina had to relate to uh, academics, mostly researchers that were abroad, uh, with the first goal to bring them back, but then with a the goal to just foster relationships. So I was the head of uh, that um, you know, program in what we called, we called it the Northeastern region of the United States. So we did a lot of activities where we took, you know, sort of Argentinian scientists back to Argentina and so on and so forth. Um, and then my, my ultimate dream was always that one day, if I managed to sell my company, I would start a foundation or a think tank, uh, which fortunately I managed to do in 2019, uh, which is called Fundar, uh, which is actually called formally Foundation for Argentinian Development, uh, with the idea of developing, uh, to having a think tank that mostly works on public policy, um, mostly works on public policy as it relates to innovation, as it relates to the idea of development through innovation, not necessarily development through other means, obviously trying to leverage my background. Um, it has a lot of unique features that I'm sure we'll talk about during this talk. But anyway, Fundar um, now has about 50 people, has been in operations for about three years. This, this is our third anniversary, and it's doing quite a lot of interesting stuff. Um, but we think that we, you know, with or I think that with Fundar, uh, we can do something quite important for, in particular for Argentina, but for Latin America, which is to think about development policies with a little bit of a different angle to more of the historical way in which we've thought about development in Latin America. Sorry, long introduction, but that's it. Oh, and why am I here? I didn't say that, but a year and a half ago, I moved to London uh, because my company, so Contigo, has a big operation here in London. So I decided that it would be better for me. I mean, I had developed a company in the US. It would be better to develop the company in uh, Europe. And the hub for us in Europe is in London. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Sam. Sorry, long.
No, no, no. That's. I tend to be long-winded, so if you wanna. <laughs> No, we have time. Thankfully, we have time. No, I was going to uh, ask you if you can perhaps elaborate more about the current role of Fundar. Uh, for those that are not aware of what Fundar is, I'm going to add that in very little time, it positioned itself as one of the leading think tanks, not only in Argentina, but also in the region. So I would like to hear more about the current mission of Fundar, the different areas in which you are working, how you're thinking about expanding networks and linkages throughout the region, and how you envision the role of think tanks and the third sector in uh, you know, contributing to developmental strategies in Latin America. Sure. And I have to start by saying that I'm not an expert in a think tanks in the rest of Latin America. Um, although we expect that over the next few years, we will significantly expand our collaboration uh, with other think tanks in, in Latin America. And, and, and I think different countries have chosen different paths, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But in Argentina, um, there is a lot of the traditional old time think, think tanks or, or foundations that were set up by the very wealthy families that didn't have very concrete missions, but they sort of existed to do a bunch of good stuff in theory. Um, it was hard to, to, to know exactly what that was. It was in a variety of areas, you know, Fundacion Perez Compank. I mean, there's like you name the rich family and there was a foundation there that would have some sort of mission, but it, but it's hard. It was always hard to connect those foundations to very concrete areas of expertise or to concrete impact that they have had. And then there are the other think tanks in Argentina, which were mostly linked to political projects. Um, there's a number of them that existed. Um, some of the parties that are there, I mean, like almost every party has their own foundation. Uh, they're clearly there to to some extent, you know, research and develop public policies for whenever that party gets to government, and to also prepare a bunch of um, of, of people for for public service uh, when the time comes. Uh, this was this is more or less the, the the two modes of existence. There's one that is maybe try to be a little bit different called CPEC, um, which you know, didn't necessarily want to be tied to a particular political project, but then in the end it did, right? So it, it's hard when you think about CPEC, it's hard to think about CPEC without thinking about a particular party in Argentina where in the end, um, a lot of it had to do with when this party was in government, CPEC provided a lot of the uh, underlying people that were CPEC, they ended up in government, right? So, so that's a little bit the landscape that, that we that I knew existed, and my idea was well, let's try to be to do something that is slightly different in in some respects, right? So one of the things that you find in in a lot of these think tanks is that they become very dependent and very hungry for financing, so their agendas get significantly conditioned by whatever funding they can find, and that is a problem. In in part, if you think about a lot of the American think tanks. Um, they manage to have more of an agenda, which comes from the fact that they have some financial stability and independence, that comes from the fact that they have an endowment that gives them some ability to determine their own agenda. That did not really happen with a lot of the uh, think tanks, I mean, other than the wealthy families that I mentioned before, right? So clearly, uh, I think one of the things that was important to me and lucky that I could afford or we could afford to do this is to have Fundar have an endowment that would give it independence in terms of the agenda that we could carry. And that would, to some extent, guarantee a little bit the independence from a political project, right? So it's not that we don't have our ideology, we do. We can talk about that too, but at the end of the day, we didn't want to be tied to any particular uh, government or political party because we wanted, we knew that we wanted to have influence we wanted to try to move the needle, and that entailed that if you tied yourself to a particular party, then your ability to move the needle becomes significantly reduced. So I think a, an overarching theme was this one of financial independence. Now, I don't expect that the endowment that Fundar has is going to last forever, especially because we're very, 
we're very ambitious in terms of what we want to do. But I believe that if we're able in the forming years to have an independence of uh, an independence of, of thought in, in, in terms of where we go, we're going to be able to dictate a lot of the future agenda, right? So it's not that Fundar doesn't look for financing, we do, but it's not something which conditions uh, our ability to tackle the topics that we want to tackle. So that was one area that to me was important. The second one, having been an academic, is I didn't want think tank, the think tank to be too academic, which meant that we would have, I mean, obviously academics are important, we want to publish, and we do publish quite a lot, but I thought it was important to have incidents, to have influence, to be able to do projects with the local authorities so that we could actually, um, so that we could actually uh, have an impact in, in terms of the society. Um, that was a second thing that was important. Some people talk about think tanks versus do tanks. I don't like necessarily that distinction. I like more this idea of not just being academic, but you know, putting, when I was in academia, the big discussion was always, are you uh, an academic or are you a practitioner? And I always thought that the best academics were the ones that could do both, right? So we want to do both. Um, the third area is, and this is again, professional deformation, I'm sure you can imagine, is the notion of based on evidence, right? It's like, to us, it's important to be um, scientifically rigorous of whatever we do. Uh, and one of the ways in which we decided to enforce that is to have actually a data department. So we actually have a department that does data, that writes policies that or deals with data as an issue, as a development issue. How do you manage data? How do governments manage data and everything else? But also it provides supports to other areas so the other areas can leverage our data skills so that when they publish some results or some research, it's actually evidence-based and we use data to do that. Um, so that we call data, uh, I call it a transversal. I don't know if that word exists, but it just cuts across all the different things that we do. Um, we wanted to do also something different, which is we wanted to have a department of gender um, to make sure that uh, we have diversity as a key topic of our agenda but not also as an independent topic. I mean, in, in Argentina, the anything has to do with gender. Actually, Argentina is quite advanced in a lot of gender policies. Um, but we also want it to be also cut across the other departments. So as we think about developmental policies, gender is something which is in the back of our minds. I don't think we have succeeded on that yet. I think we have a good agenda in gender per se, but I don't think we have necessarily permeated the gender agenda into the other areas, but I think we're going to get there. And then we organized ourselves mostly with what we call vertical areas. So the vertical areas have to do with particular areas of development that we think are important or in some sense um, relevant to the uh, potential development of Argentina. Uh, so I'm going to start with the one that will sound less relevant with respect to development. Uh, which is justice. So we have an area which essentially looks at what are ways in which we can improve the judicial system in Argentina, which is criticized by almost everybody within, within uh, the country. Um, and then we have other areas that are more sort of traditional that you could find in, in, uh, um, in think tanks. We have a macroeconomics area because in Argentina, everything is about the macro. And if you don't have a macroeconomic department, then you know, you're less relevant because if we don't solve the macroeconomics, everybody says that we're not going to be able to do much more. Um, and then we have a department which we call, I mean, which you could call industrial policy. Uh, we're believers in industrial policy, big believers in industrial policy and big believers in the opportunities that are there for Latin America when it comes to industrial policy. And I think we call it desarrollo productivo. Um, and then we have natural resources. And in natural resources, we all obviously deal with anything that has to do with the exploitation of natural resources in Argentina, but also with the issues related to climate and climate change and all the things that are happening there. That's a little bit of a broad sense of 
what we do. Um, you should visit the webpage, www.fund.ar, fundar, fund .ar, and um, we publish a lot. There's a lot of topics that we work on, and um, there's a lot of work that is there that we, we are sort of open source, so anything that you want to quote. And of course, a lot of this work we do um, uh, in, in partnership with government. Could it, be it could be local government. It could be the central government. We don't necessarily um, discriminate in any way, shape, or form who we work with. Uh, there is another final point about the think tank, which is one of our ideas <laughs> is not necessarily to do all the areas that we believe are relevant. Some of them we do in partnership. So for example, everything has to do with social policies, which is critical for Argentina. We don't do ourselves, we do in, or we do in partnerships with another think tank that we think is, is actually very, very good. So not to try to reinvent the wheel, especially if there's think tanks. I mean, human rights is another think tank that is in Argentina where or there's human rights think tanks which are very strong in Argentina. We don't want to necessarily develop those capabilities. Um, we stop there. So before we transition to having a conversation, uh, a broader conversation about development and inequality, and not only in Argentina and in the region, I wanted to push you a bit further on the role of Fundar in the current Argentine uh, context. And for instance, I was wondering what are the challenges that Fundar and other think tanks might find in a country that has no strong connect, uh, tradition of connecting and engaging with uh, think tanks, with uh, policymakers that are not part of the state apparatus. Some people might argue, not even with international organizations, right? So what are the, what are the challenges that you've been facing so far? And uh, if you can tell us something about how you think those challenges might be circumvented to create an harmonious uh, sort of uh, collaboration between state third party sector. Yeah. So I'm a very optimistic guy. So when people see challenges, I see opportunity okay? every time. And when, you know, I know there's questions about Argentina being, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I always see opportunity so that, you know, I'm conditioning. I think being an entrepreneur sort of forces you to go in that dimension, even though now I've become a corporate guy, um, which I don't particularly like. But in any case, I think that for us, the experiences have been very positive. So, I mean, we are a little bit lucky in some respects. So first of all, we started with COVID. And the first things we did when we got started was to say, okay, look, here's a national emergency. Let's try to figure out which ways we can help with in COVID. And we had an opportunity to interact with various government entities, which actually opened the door. Some were easier than others, but I would say that most of them were reasonably welcoming. Um, I would say, obviously, the big, the big issue in, in Latin America, but in Argentina in particular, is the lack of a civil service, which is sophisticated, that has been there for a long time, that has the expertise and that you can efficiently interact with it. I mean, what happens in Argentina is it's, it's a very pendular kind of country. So the civil service goes into one direction, goes into another. And the, 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 the people that are there, you know, perpetually, or at least that belong to the civil service, they're not as strong necessarily as what you would expect. So what Mariana would call the capacities of the state are not really there sometimes. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to say, okay, look, what are your, what are your needs and how can we complement those needs? So because we don't ask for money, which is always helpful, uh, because we go there with a very open mind of saying, how can we help you? I think so far it's been mostly with open arms. I mean, obviously there's things that don't work because the bureaucracy just, you know, you get stuck into a contract, another contract, and even if you're gonna do something for free, there's just an impossibility to do it because the person that needs to decide is suddenly there, not there. I mean, all these difficulties are there for sure. But I would say that for us, the experience has been actually quite positive and quite welcoming. Because we're not affiliated with a political party to some extent, we have looked on purpose to collaborate with people from different political parties, right? So we work with the city of Buenos Aires, which belongs to one party, and we work with 
the national government that belongs to another party. We work with provincial parties um, or provincial, you know, with governors, or we work with sometimes with the local mayors. Um, so we have found that, you know, people are reasonably open to those kinds of collaborations. We don't ask for much in return. The question I don't think is so much whether um, people accept is how much impact are we have. And I think right now, I think it's fair to say that impact is limited. <laughs> um, it was not my expectation that we would have a huge impact, but what is true is that a, a lot of people read what we write and were frequently cited by politicians uh, in terms of our studies. Uh, what we do is not necessarily yet used as policy, is not yet used as the law that goes into, um, you know, into the chambers or, or the projects of, of law for the chambers, but we're, we're, we're making progress. Good to hear. I think that's also a positive note for our, for our students to know that it's not all about the pessimistic view, but I mean, the pessimistic view is still there, right? There is this widespread idea that Argentina, as many other Latin American countries, had everything to succeed, had the resources, had the capital, the human capital, but also uh, natural resources and so on to succeed as an economy. And it did not at some point that did not happen. And that there were a set of historical opportunities that were not, uh, that were lost. That, that's a, a very widespread idea, right? Not only about Argentina, but as I was saying about other um, Latin American economies. Uh, we know by now that you would not agree with that type of perspective. No, I think you have to look, you have to agree with the, the numbers are the numbers, right? You cannot hide the numbers. If you look at the numbers for Argentina, uh, between 1945 and 1975, Argentina was growing at 2% a year. It's not stellar, but if you consistently grow at 2% a year, the beauty of compounding is actually quite powerful. Now, since 1975, 1976, that has not been the case. There's been, you know, the typical pendulum in Argentina. There's this guy who's very famous called Marcelo Diamant that wrote a lot about the pendulum of, you know, neoliberal governments and not and so on and so forth and how the policies change. So you, you cannot escape the fact that the numbers are bad for Argentina. And if you look at, if you don't look at Argentina, but you look at Mexico and the largest countries, Mexico and Brazil, the numbers are you know, not as bad maybe as Argentina, but similar, right? I mean, there is a certain stagnation. There is a development or these countries made a lot of progress until the 70s, maybe the beginning of the 80s, but then that progress really stagnated. So clearly the region is at a state that you cannot Hide, which is of not having made much progress when some other parts of the world made a lot of progress, right? I mean, just look at Asia versus Latin America. Clearly, the equation is very, very different. Now, I, I, I personally think that that should, I mean, that's the past and you cannot deny it, but that's not necessarily the future. The future is up to you to do it. Um, now, clearly, you know, it's, it's like this, this um, the famous saying, you know, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. But it's up to us, it's up to people like us to make that different, right? I mean, if you looked at Korea in the 1960s and you look at the historical development of South Korea until the 1960s, first of all, I'm sure, I mean, you may know this, um, but North Korea was richer than South Korea in the 1960s, right? And if you look at Korea in the 1960s and you look at Korea today, or you look at Korea 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I mean, the progress that it made is, 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 is incredible. And clearly there were no reasons for that, right? I mean, it was not in the history, it was not in the country, it was not in the natural resources. It was uh, a decision by, <coughs> you know, a bunch of people and then society went with it of just having a mission and going after it, right? And, and obviously that's what's needed for Latin America, but what I think you have to understand is, except for Mexico and Brazil, that have internal markets that can support a development agenda by themselves, right? So in theory, they don't need the rest of the world and they could develop or they could try to develop by using the internal markets. This is not the case for the rest of Latin America. The markets are too small. And so something is needed if you're gonna, if these countries are gonna develop by 
certainly increasing exports, which is one of the things that they need to do, they're going to have to um, trade with others, right? And, and I think there, you, you, you know the challenges, right? If you trade with the rest of the world that is much more advanced than you are, or that where the industries that they have are much more advanced than yours, and you have an open border and an open pra and, a, and a, a free or no, no tariffs kind of policy, then you run the risk that that destroys completely your own development, that that you know, depletes your, your foreign reserves, and that is not an equation that works. Um, obviously, you have to develop markets that are more sensible, and the natural opportunity for Latin America is to think about the Latin American market. And in this geopolitical time where you have clearly two poles forming um, as, as clear drivers of the future power in the world, which are, I'm going to call them China and the U.S., but you can call it the Western world and China. And I'm, I'm not putting Russia there for obvious reasons. You know, it is China that will dominate that other equation. In that geopolitical map, it's an interesting opportunity for Latin America to say, you know, the famous, we're not aligned necessarily with one or the other, but we have a region where we can have some power for ourselves, some geopolitical power that would be important, right? Because I, I don't think it's a good idea to choose sides. Actually, personally, I think that your development agenda has to be very selfish, meaning if it's good for you to do this and it's good for you to do that, then you should do both and not necessarily choose what you know, somebody wants. And so I think the, the big opportunity for Latin America is as we look forward to think more regionally than individually for these countries, especially for the smaller countries that cannot develop with an internal market. Um, now we can talk about why I, I can, I think my optimistic, I like, I always, in Argentina, there's always this debate, right? That pessimism is intellectual, and optimism is naive, right? So this is the, so many people accuse me of being naive, right? And I don't think I'm naive, uh, anything but, uh, but I, I don't buy this notion that, that you can be, you, can, you cannot be opti optimist, uh, an optimist and being an intellectually honest optimist. I think there is many reasons to be optimistic about the future, but I think you have to have a story and you have to think about what is it that you want to do? And we collectively have to have that exercise as a continent um, to be able to succeed. Before I, I um, go on with my next question, I wanted to remind the audience that the floor is open and it would be interesting to have a, more of a conversation between all of us. Uh, but I am very interested in hearing more uh, about your view of development in Argentina and in Latin America, and as a business person that comes from the, the tech sector, what is your perspective on the role of technology in the in the current context and how uh, technology can can be a force that might help countries like Argentina to develop further? Okay, so so let me let me um, let me attack these things. I mean, with with a little bit of my experience as an entrepreneur, right? I was running a company that was small relative to my competition. My competition was, you know, 10 times bigger than I was at least. I mean, obviously when I started, they were, you know, infinitely bigger, but, but like more or less at some point in time, they were 10 times bigger, they had many more resources, much more well-known and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so when I was in a situation where I was the challenger, the, the famous David versus Goliath and all that. So I, I, I thought to myself that there were two things that I needed. One is I needed to have good clients. And the reason that I need to have good clients is because my, the way that I would be able to compete successfully is I would have to hug somebody who was much bigger than me. And the only piece, people that I could hug that were much bigger than me or my, much bigger than us were my clients. And my clients were the big institutions. And I thought, if I have good partnerships with these big institutions, what they're going to do is they're going to speak very highly of us to others. And, you know, of course, this is a very incestuous industry, the financial industry. Everybody moves jobs 20 times in their lifetime. Everybody goes from one place to the other. So it didn't matter that I would say I'm better than my competitor, but it would definitely matter if the big guys, the big boys or the sophisticated boys said, 
you know, these guys are good guys. So that was one. That was needed. It's not enough, but I thought that was a necessary condition for us to be able to succeed. You always try to tie yourself with others. That's why I think in Latin America, it's like, let's not think small, let's think big, right? Let's think about how together we can do more because together we're bigger. Uh, the second one was I needed a disruption. Because what happens with a disruption is everybody changes their frame of mind, right? So if you are, if everything is going steady and people have no reason to change, they keep doing what they were doing before, they keep buying from the biggest ones, nobody gets fired from buying IBM kind of thing. As long as there's no disruption, inertia is the strongest force of nature, right? I mean, I always say that inertia is the strongest force of nature and it's true, you, you will be able, when you go into business, you will find then most of the reason that things don't change is because of inertia. And so what changes inertia? A disruption. What happened to me or what happened to us was we were lucky, and I'm gonna say this in this small room, and it should not be repeated. We were lucky that the financial crisis happened. Why? Because that was a disruption that killed a lot of our potential clients, that this, this. I mean, everybody started thinking we were doing risk management. Everybody started thinking, oh, now, what do we need to do? Risk management, right? Who are the people that have been investing in risk management? Not the guys that gave us the systems that didn't allow us to risk manage during the financial sector. Let's look for other companies that are doing risk management systems. They're novel, they're different. They're gonna be able to allow us to do things differently. Guess what? It happened, we were there. You know, in fact, people know this or don't know this very much, but our competitor that was a much more established company used to recalibrate the risk models once a month, okay? So if you recalibrate your risk models once a month, and I don't know if you remember, but it doesn't matter, you know, September, whatever it was, seven, eight, nine, when Lehman collapsed, guess what you need to do to your risk models? Do you think you're gonna wait until the end of the month until you recalibrate? Well, there is a major event that requires recalibration. Guess what we were doing? Daily recalibration. Guess what they told us a year ago? Who needs daily recalibration? Things don't change that quickly. Why do you need to recalibrate? You have too much noise. Guess what happened when Lehman collapsed? Everybody said daily recalibration, okay? So what is the disruption today? Climate change. Clearly, I mean, the world will change. I mean, the, 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 everything is going to be rethought because we need to figure out a way to live with the planet because the way that we have right now is not gonna survive. So ultimately, there is a disruption in the world. I believe there is a disruption in the world, an economic disruption in the world that in, in every dimension, and that's going to force everybody to rethink their agendas. It's going to give rise to all new industries. There's new things that are going to be thought of. There's new things that are going to be done. And in that context, I think you have an opportunity as a country to think about, in this new reality, how can I compete? How can I distinguish myself? How can I do something which is novel? Because there's going to be a need for innovation. So the big topic is, can we innovate? Can Latin America innovate? Can Argentina innovate? Can our countries find a way to do it? And, and the way to do it, trust me, is not to say, look, let's buy cheap windmills from Norway because they make the best, the best windmills because then we're going to be dependent forever. What are we gonna do? We're just gonna import the windmills rather than importing other things. We have to figure out a way to develop these industries ourselves. And the problem is of course, the kicking away the ladder, right? I mean, these guys in Norway, they're gonna subsidize the heck out of their sustainable industries because they know that that's the future. They need to compete with the Americans, with the other Europeans and everybody else. So when they tell us, oh, you're not allowed to subsidize, you know what we have to tell them? is, sorry, man, I'm going to do what's best for me, not what you tell me. So this is what I mean, but we have to have a north, we have to have a, a, a vision of where we want the future to be, and then we have to execute against it. But I think we have the ingredients. <clears throat> there's one more other, um, there, there's one other disruption in the world, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, which is artificial intelligence. And I have a very optimistic view of artificial intelligence. So people say artificial intelligence, that's it, we're done. It's gonna replace all of us. There's gonna be no need for anybody to do anything else because artificial intelligence is gonna take away jobs, it's gonna change the economy, 
a lot of people are going to lose their jobs and blah, blah, blah. I disagree. I think like in, like in every time there's been in the world a disruption of that form, a technological disruption, there is an opportunity to do that disruption to your favor. And again, I think that's another discontinuity that we have where things will change. And my, my um, so there's an article that's coming this week, but um, I've been fascinated by ChatGPT. I'm sure all of you mm -hmm. have, but, 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 and all of you use it, I'm sure. But I've been fascinated because of the reverse, right? The, the reverse question, which is to me, the key question is how to use ChatGPT to, look, to, to reduce the gap between the haves and the have nots. So just the, I mean, what people think is that what, what artificial intelligence will do is it will just make the differences that exist today even bigger, right? The disenfranchised, as they call them, are gonna be even more disenfranchised because what artificial intelligence is gonna do is just gonna separate and split, right? And I think a little bit the opposite. I think that what artificial intelligence gives us if we use it right, is a way to educate people in a different kind of education, maybe it's a little bit like cheating, but to give people more capabilities quicker than we could have ever given them before, because we can have them use artificial intelligence to their, to their benefit. So I think there's two big changes in the world that will change the global equation, and I think will provide opportunities for Latin America to do. It's a fascinating conversation. I want to give yeah, everyone the opportunity to intervene here. So. Uh, okay, we, yeah, we have a question here, and then we'll share. Okay. Okay. Um, so my name is Tomas. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here to hear it. Um, so you spoke a little bit about Brazil. I'm Brazilian, and I wanted to understand um, how do you see you look at Brazil and Mexico? They have, of course, this strong internal market already. But they can they can try to develop themselves alone. Um, but how do you see these countries? that have the market more developed, helping the other countries in Latin America. If we think about Latin America developing as a region, how can these countries not only be selfish, as I said, that it is important to be selfish, but to look at other countries, their neighbors um, that are there? Yeah, look, I mean, I think big markets help smaller economies, right? So it would be much more beneficial for countries like certainly Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Colombia to export or, or have these markets as preferred markets. So I think there is opportunities to do that. I think there's an opportunity to have, to think regionally, strategically about how we can quote unquote divide the pie and where we have some of the opportunities and create you know, positive ecosystems of development. Um, what has happened in countries like, um, so in Mexico, obviously there is more of an industry, but a lot of the industry is not necessarily developing its own capabilities and innovation, right? A lot of it is assembly, and it's not something that really is going to move the needle for Mexico, Mexico in terms of an industrial power. I think what has happened in Brazil is we've gone backwards in terms of, you know, Brazil for a long time had industries that were far ahead of a lot of other countries, and it has primarized, I don't know if that's the word, but it, its economy has become more dependent on on uh, you know on ex on 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 primary exports than than it used to be, and I think that's a problem. Um, I think that we should think about you know and, and again Argentina is the ultimate economy that you know it exports a lot of soy and wheat and you know all the all the basic raw materials and it now has a huge opportunity with oil and gas, but I think we have to think about those industries as bridges to development. We don't think it's the, I don't think it's the end goal. I don't think you can develop a country with the basic industries, but I think if we think about it, if we think about them intelligently, they can serve as a bridge to what I think is going to be the big leverage, right? I think the, 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 the biggest industries that have helped or that have grown over the last few years are the ones that have huge leverage. And those are the industries that you should try to invest in. And again, a lot of it is driven. I had this conversation with uh, one of the great things about being in London is I became great friends with Hajun Chang, who I'm sure you all know is one of the great minds when it comes to development. And he says, he says something which is, I think, very clever is that 
He says the problem of, of Latin America is not the lack of capabilities or not the lack of expertise, is really to have used that expertise for things that don't leverage, right? That have no leverage. This is the problem, right? It, it's not, you know, you know, he gives the example of Chile. So it's not my example, it's his example. So you don't like him. But he says the salmon industry in Chile, right? It's great expertise. I mean, what Chile has done with the salmon industry is phenomenal in terms of the expertise. It's non-trivial, right? In Argent Let me pick up in Argentina. The soy complex is fantastic expertise, but it's just used to something that doesn't really have that leverage. So the key for development is to find those industries that have that really that leverage. So anyway, just to answer your question, I think that we have to think regionally. And I think we have to think that in the new geopolitical context, we can significantly help each other. It's challenging for Mexico because it has a big neighbor that has this big pull, right? But I think it is possible if we get together and we think with that Latin American mentality of doing something different. We have another question during the back. Please introduce yourself if you, if you want. Yes, sure. Um, hi, I'm Natalia. I am also from Brazil. I'm doing my master's at GCL. And um, I want to hear your views, maybe in a summary, because I'm aware we can talk about it all day, about this, the Latin American state's capacity to innovate and what is missing, like, fundamentally, um, and about the network governance, like, all of these different actors influencing policymaking, what does that say to the state's capacity to innovate? Yeah, great question. So what I found in Argentina, and again, I'm not an expert in Brazil. So it, I, I mean, Bra Brazil has done phenomenally when it comes to academia and the development of universities and R&D has really, but the, 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 key, the key factor um, and I lived a lot in the, in the, in the U.S., so you see it in the U.S., is, is the transfer of technology. So the key is not whether you have the capabilities. And again, let's go back to Argentina. If you go to Conicet and you go to the labs, there's a lot of capabilities there. There's a lot of capabilities to do first, you know, first world kind of research, like really state of the art. But we significantly fail at the transfer of technology. So that fails for two reasons. One is because there's not a good mechanism for that IP to transfer to the private sector or for that IP to go into something where it can be leveraged. And I, I always like to say that, you know, the U.S. is one extreme, right, which is the state pours billions, trillions of dollars into R&D. They don't care. You know, at the end of the day, if something was developed with money from the NSF, and it ends up in a private company and they make a ton of money, they don't care. Like, you know, I'll tell you my story. When I, I got the career award from the NSF, right? And I went to my NSF guy from, I was at Columbia. I went to my NSF guy and I said, you know, I have a problem, which is I'm going to leave Columbia. And now you gave me this huge grant and now I'm going to start a company. He said, phenomenal. Great idea. Doesn't matter. Take your research and develop it in your company. No problem, right? So zero questions asked. To some extent, the consequence of that is you have a poor state because the, you know, the, the U.S. is a rich country, but you know, not not the government is not rich. Well, the government has huge deficits and, and you know has not a great balance sheet, but it doesn't matter. But you know, they do a huge transfer, and the transfer is free. Okay, so that obviously works wonders for the private industry. It doesn't necessarily give back as much as it should give back. But the U.S. has the mentality that that will come back to help you in the future. How, when, who knows, but it works, right? Eventually, Google pay tax, will pay taxes. Right now, they don't, but one day, they will pay taxes. <coughs> Worst case scenario, we have all the data from everyone in the world, so we can make money with it. So um, that's the U.S. mentality. Argentina has, I'm going to pick on Argentina, has a little bit the opposite mentality, right, it's, which is, this was developed by the state before we decide how this is going to be used. And if you want to use it in private industry, let's figure out how we're going to divide the pie. And let's figure out how this is going to be this and the IP stays, blah, blah, blah. And I always say, if you want to make sure that something is divided equally, there's a very easy way that I can always divide something equally amongst as many people as I want, which is to divide zero. 
So zero divided by anything is zero to everybody, which is equally the same, right? So there you have the two polar opposites. Let me give you a personal experience that I had with um, Conicet. Uh, we had our R&D center in Argentina, and we wanted to hire somebody who is a, an invest, uh, a researcher at Conicet to come here. And we wanted to do it formally. Most people do it under the day. I mean, they don't tell anything to Conicet. They do it, and they do whatever they want to do. We wanted to do it formally. So we went to Conicet, and we say, we want to sign something that says that this guy can work for us, blah, blah, blah. You know what they told us? Is yeah, but at this point, Connie said, owns your IP, or at least shares in your IP. And I'm like, look, I'm not going to contaminate my IP, which is my company's IP, for this person that comes as an individual to work at Connie said, this is not going to happen, right? So this is a key, a key question, question of what is a good mechanism for transfer of the technology? I don't think it has to be the American system, but it doesn't have to be something that where we're always, always thinking about how we're going to divide it up front. Um, the, the final point is, of course, then there is the question of, is there a market right, to do that? Uh, and here, let me give you another example, which is the biotechnology, biotechnology market in Argentina. In biotech, we were able to do that very successfully in Argentina. So there are very successful biotech companies in Argentina that use and develop biotech technology that gets used in the fields, and because there is a market. For a lot of these other things, there is not really an easy market to find out. So I think the question of coming together and figuring out markets is a good way of thinking about how to do this. The network effect doesn't exist. So the, there is no discussion between, you know how the European Union has, you know, sort of these common centers where everybody shares and technology, they have grants. All of that doesn't exist in Latin America and it should. I want to leave time for you. Yeah. Several questions are not too much time, but no, no, no. We have yeah. Go, let's. I'm yeah, going to try to be shorter in my answer. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was great. And um, my, I think um, you mentioned several important points, and it's about like the energy, like the uh, climate change and uh, leverage points. So I think that actually uh, Latin America, and especially like Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina with the energy transition, we'll have a lot of leverage in terms of critical minerals because the energy transition depends on, uh, to a great extent, on natural resources like cobalt, lithium, yeah. among others. So actually, in the coming years, it's becoming increasingly important how we manage these resources. So I just want to know from your screen of view what would be the ideal like uh, research management for this region of Latin America, and also in terms of industrial policy, because that's also a very important part. Um, yeah, great question. Also, again, I'm an amateur at this, so I'll give you my a little bit my idea. But you should you should know that I'm not an expert at, at this field. So, I mean, the, the obvious is we don't want to export just the minerals, right? This is the obvious thing. Um, there's a question of in Argentina, in particular, there's a question of who owns the resource. It's the provinces, not the state. I don't know how it is in Bolivia and other places. So there, there is a little bit of an issue of who is the quote unquote owner of the resource and how you're going to spread that. I personally think that the natural, the natural way to exploit these resources is with strategic partnerships with other countries. I, I'm a big believer in strategic partnerships. I think you can do strategic partners and you can do strategic partnerships on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I think you have to be very demanding. <laughs> I don't think you have to be like you know Germans or whatever, let me give all my lithium to Samsung and then, you know, they can do whatever they want. I think you can be very demanding. And to me, what is demanding is to gain the expertise. <laughs> you need to gain the expertise. The expertise has to be left in the place where you have actually the resources. That's going to take a lot of time, but I think that can be done through partnerships. Obviously, there's the whole idea of local suppliers that you can force. I mean, I think you really have to think about it as a deal that will give you something for the long run. And it's not just the resources. It's not just the temptation is going to be, let me just get a lot of the taxes that come out of the exploitation of these resources. And then it's like money that goes and flies. You know, it's like to some extent it's like the carry trade. Then somehow it gets spent somehow, and you don't know nothing was left, right? So you have to be left with capacities or local capacities. 
obviously, I don't want to minimize by any stretch of the imagination the, the, the environmental impact that all of these things are going to have. This has to be done very well, and you have to be very strict. It has to be, mo be monitored very, very closely so that you don't create environmental hazards with any of this location. Next question. Yeah. Hi, Sebastian. Thank you. My, my name is Nahuel. Um, I'm the current chairman of APARU, which is the um, Association of Argentine Professionals in the UK. And I've been living abroad for quite a long time, as, as well as you did. Um, you mentioned that you were director of RAICES, uh, which yeah. was a program at the beginning to repatriate scientists to Argentina. Uh, but I understand that then changed its mission. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. What do you think is, um, or how, how much impact do you think we people from Latin America living abroad can have in- Fantastic question. Innovation? One of my favorite topics. <laughs> okay. I'm a huge believer in, in the diaspora. Okay. And again, we have to learn from the country. I, there's nothing to reinvent in this world. We have to learn from the countries that have done it well. So in Argentina, we speak about, or we talk about um, fuga de cerebros. I don't know how you even translate that. Yeah. Right. Brain drain, right? Brain drain. I think this is bullshit. Sorry. It's complete bullshit. I mean, like, yeah, there's smart people that leave and that go somewhere else. The key is how do you make them part of the system? You have to make them part of your own system. I mean, it's like, you know, I, I, I said, sorry to bring this up, guys, but I will. Uh, in the World Cup, right? Uh, so, no, but, but no, the, the, look, I thought there was a fantastic opportunity in the World Cup. If you look at the Argentinian team, I think there were one or two that played in Argentina that didn't even play in the main team. All of them played somewhere else. Is anybody asking the question why these guys are not back in Argentina? This, you know, they went and made their money? No, because they bring their skills, their, you know, they benefited from being abroad. They're part of the, di they're part of the diaspora. To me, the Argentinian team was a diaspora team. Fantastic. They go and win the World Cup. Right? Do we care? We don't. So this is a huge problem that we we don't think about the diaspora, the Latin American, diaspora, all the Argentinians, Brazilians, Colombians, whatever you want that are abroad. Let's use them to our favor. Everybody wants to help. And let's not make it a condition that says, oh, but you have to come back because otherwise you're not. Good. No, nobody asks Messi that he has to come back. Otherwise, he cannot play for the national team. I mean, you will get shot if you said that. So why would you say that to a scientist? Why? The scientist wants to be in Oxford, Cambridge. Well, let them be wherever they want to be. Who cares? But bring them, bring them into the system. Make them part of it. Make them collaborate. Make them, you know, educate people <laughs> or bring people here. Who cares? Again, in this world, we don't, I, I don't think it matters that much. I think what matters is that that expertise is used for a good cause. And I think the diaspora concept is a concept that we should leverage as a continent and def definitely as a country, but we should leverage as a continent. And we should know, we should learn from the things that we've done already and that we've done well. So the idea of Raices, to answer your question, um, was that, right? I mean, when I came to Raices, I said, forget about this idea of repatriating scientists. They don't want to go back. This is after 10 years, they're here and they're stuck. Why are we going to you know, discriminate these guys that are here in the U.S.? Let's not. And, and, it, and it worked. Okay. Very passionate about this issue, as I'm sure you can tell. I think we should take all the final questions together and then wrap it up there. Okay, so multiple uh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rapid fire. How many hands do we have? One here, there. Okay, three at least. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sophia. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I used to work in Chilean venture capital, so very excited to. Hear you chat. So we're not going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about China and sort of the geopolitical discussion that you were talking about, about this sort of idea of Latin American countries being selfish, pushing back in trade relationships. And obviously, I'm from the U.S., so there's a long-standing sort of political coercion in, in Latin America from the U.S., which I recognize as sort of there's a long history there, but China is this growing power, the biggest trade partner of most countries in Latin America now, and holds a huge amount of Latin American debt. 
debt, which I've seen across many countries that's led to China having a coercive economic power in terms of the development paths of especially smaller Latin American countries. So I'm wondering how you see sort of the future of smaller Latin American countries with a lot of debt sign our economic relationship continuing to have power in this country. Okay, so we have the China question. Okay, keep going. Yeah, sorry, because, yeah, before we go on, just so we know, we are going to have a Catherine, so we can keep on. Just, just don't pay attention to what's going on. I have to know, be so somewhere at four. The so only problem. I have a, I have a plane to catch. Okay. <laughs> Okay, climate. Well, yeah. Right here and the last one over there. Yeah. yeah. I just want to ask you, like, from your point of view, considering that you that you work also in academia and now working on development issues and on a very innovative sector, like, what do you believe is like our main challenge as Latin Americans to start, like, thinking about the rust disrupting, like businesses on issues like the other day i saw this kind of ranking like saying what what's the main goal of latin americans to become like as a professional and most of our countries are like to become influencers while the rest of the world many countries are to become astronauts or scientists and this kind of stuff and this kind of inspired me like what what are we lacking or what 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 do our educational system the good news about influencers is that they have a lot of leverage uh, Okay, there's one more. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Um, so hearing you talk about you know learning from what other countries have done well uh, and just applying that. I mean, it's really interesting because I study economic history here at here at LSE. But something that gets talked about recently in some like circles, I don't know to what extent this is accurate or not, is that. Some are theorizing that we may be embarking on a process of deglobalization. Um, if that is the case, if that is the case, what would that mean for sort of uh, Latin American strategies for sort of development, given that, for instance, many of the East Asian states would develop their own industries, but then they would export them afterwards the end. So just yeah, wondering what your view was. Okay. Cool. <laughs> No, 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 it's it's good. And let's try to tie somehow together the China question with your question. Um, so, I mean, look, Ch China has been very smart. I think about, you know, there's been a void by the European Union and the Americans to a large extent of providing resources, capital, expertise, whatever it is, in a lot of places that have been disregarded, right? I mean, in, I would say that in Europe, Latin America is mostly ignored. Um, I would say in the US, it's only used when it's needed, but not necessarily. At least, at least there's not bad interventionism anymore, at least very less of it. Um, and China has seen this as a tremendous opportunity and they've taken advantage of it. And I think what we have to say, I mean, is to whomever criticizes us for doing business with China. I mean, in the case of Argentina, the problem with the business with China is that it's deficit. So that's a, that's a different, I mean, we should have lots of business with China, which is positive, right? Not, not negative, but anyway. Um, I think we, should, we have to leverage China with the West. We have to say, look, if you want us to do less business with China, what do you have to offer? Because otherwise these guys are here, they're ready, they have the expertise, they have the money. Um, and I think China has been tremendously smart in that respect. Uh, I don't think, I think again, as long as your interests are the one that drives your policy, I don't have any concerns about China. I think China can be managed. I think it's less fun to do business with China than with Europe. I think it's maybe less interesting, but it could be more um, economic on that makes sense. I think that what is what is interesting, what I find interesting is, for example, the countries that there's few countries that do lots of business with both China and the U.S. One great example is South Korea, half and half, right? So they manage to do more or less half and half of their business with each. 
it's very interesting how South Korea managed to do that and maybe how they themselves want to diversify in the case, I think the big danger is if one of the two makes you choose, right? And says, okay, now you cannot do both at the same time. Either you're with me or you're against me. And um, this, this would be problematic. So how you diversify, I mean, I, I do risk management, right? The key to risk management is diversification. So what you should have when you think about foreign policy, when you think about commerce, is a diversified uh, portfolio because that's what's going to give you uh, more opportunity. Uh, with respect to um, more, you know, sort of geopolitically speaking, uh, I think we have an opportunity when when we're playing. I mean, it's hard to play geopolitics. Very hard. Very difficult business. And in particular, when you have you know the Chinese American agenda, which is you know, clashing and it's, so I, I think there the opportunity for Latin America is to really think together, about it, okay? is to organize ourselves and see how we can become a force in the way that we, we, we talk to both, both sides. But I think we should do commerce with both. There's no question. Um, with respect to climate, I think that the, the, the big question in climate is that we, we cannot be the sacrificial lambs in Latin America, meaning we need to be all the ones doing all the good things while the Western world and the developed world has used the climate to their advantage for so long, and now they want us to do the sacrifices. So I think there it's important to have a united view in which we have you know, frank discussions with the developed nations and say, look guys, I mean, at the end of the day, Argentina, I think it's one to two percent of the total, you know, sort of uh, carbon emission. So we're not going to move the needle. So we're happy to go in this direction because we see it as an opportunity and we should embrace it. But we should ask for something in return for sure. So I think that's very important. And what was your question? Um, regarding what, what, do you, what do you think we're missing or we're lacking? Like, like more towards disrupting and creating business. I think it, I, the key to disruption is innovation. <laughs> we need to innovate. And innovation is a beautiful word, um, but innovation, in my mind, entails, you know, they call it in the US, they have a word which I love. It's American ingenuity. They talk about American ingenuity. Uh, I think it's hard to innovate if you're a pessimist. Because why? You know, it's like, everything is shit. It's, why am I going to do anything different, right? You just stay with whatever you're doing. So I think innovation requires a different frame of mind. I think we have the intellectual capacity. I think we have the educational system that should allow us to have enough innovation. Again, innovation is not something that is going to happen everywhere. You need to, I mean, it tends to happen more in the elite places than not elite places. But I think you can also innovate at the local level. But to me, it, it just, it's a chip that we need to change. It's a little bit of a mentality. We need, you know, I always like to say when they, anybody asks me in Argentina, I always say that um, we have to believe in ourselves. The, the, the key thing for succeeding in anything you do in life is to believe that you can make it. I talk about suspension of disbelief. To me, is the key for anything is you are young, you're all, you all have anything. You can do anything. Trust me, you can do anything you want. The key is to suspend this belief. If you start by saying, no, I cannot do it. I'm not good enough. Forget it. You, you fail. I mean, I can guarantee you that anybody that goes into anything with a pessimistic attitude is going to fail. That I can guarantee. Now, I cannot guarantee that if you go with an optimistic attitude, you're going to succeed. I cannot guarantee that. But I need it, I think it's a necessary condition. So my, again, I think we need to suspend this belief at the individual level, at the group level, at the country level, and at the continent level. And we have to have leaders, we have to have people that give us a vision that we can all embrace and that we can go after. And I think, of course, this is a lot of what's needed is leadership that talks to us about something different than crap, which is what a lot of, unfortunately, Latin America uh, 
especially Latin American politics does, right? So, and, and a lot of it has to come from change. I personally think that a lot of it can happen from places like the third sector. I think it's very important to be involved. I think it's very important to participate and innovate from wherever you are. Always try, my, my advice to all of you, and I'll finish with this, is to always try to think differently. Try to think outside of the box and try to think that you can do it. Thank you. Thank you for a second. We have a So I know we have drinks and Lady Alunas, but mm -hmm. I live in London. So if at any point in time um, anybody wants to, or we want to organize a chat, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I'm working on setting up Fundar in the UK. So this is uh, important because I'm going to be here for the foreseeable future. So, um, and for those of you who are, you know, we, we are trying to to collaborate as much as possible with local entities here because we think that there's a lot of great expertise in the UK when it comes to development and developmental policies. And there's some voices that are slightly different, um, more optimistic about the future, which I think is, is also part of our DNA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.